gracious father. So I'd like to call you dad. God, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, you allow us to be in an atmosphere of worship. And God, we understand that there's power in our worship. And God, we connect our worship with our prayer and our praise. God, we understand that there's God magnificent things that can happen. We learned this week, God, in BBS, that God for loving and caring, God, and forgiving God. We're forever faithful. And you've given us, God, an unsurmountable amount of power to our praise. So, Father God, with those, God, that we have in our hearts, Father, we ask you, God, we lift them up before you today. That you bless them, God. Family members that are in love, not physically, God, but in their mind, in their heart, and in their spirit. Father, we declare today on our worship, God, that they're set free. God, the world is a crazy place. And we thank you for protecting us, God. But God, we also ask you to protect those, God, who are not covered under your blood. Because there are children out there, God, that you are calling to come home. So, God, our prayer is that they hear you today and they invite themselves into your kingdom through your son, through your blood, through your mercy, and through your grace, God. Father, we just thank you because, God, you found us worthy to be before you with praise. Oh, God. Trust in him. 
honored to be here today. God, we can say that because we are. Uh, Father, your word speaks so clearly. Uh, I just recall Father Romans 8, 28, 29. That uh, you will use everything to make us like Jesus because you desire to do things. And so we We carry in your presence this morning. Father, we ask that you would just speak to our lives. We thank you, Father, that you have been holding us in your arms. And that you are enjoying our presence, our time with you, just as much as you are enjoying our time with you. And Father, I it's a balance. Uh, I, I know that there's a message that needs to be spoken this morning. But God, there's just something special about sitting with you. God, feeling the comfort, knowing that you're in control, knowing that we don't have to worry about anything. I was thinking about Philippians chapter 4 as we were sitting there and I was praying about it. There's a, there's a growth that takes place at the relational development that we've been talking about uh, that Paul apparently discovered after he'd known you for over 20-some years. <clears throat> Father, he, he mentions it this way, that he had learned the secret of being content in any of every situation, whether being well-fed or hungry or being in plenty of and want. Because he could do everything through you and you. And so, Father, I thank you for the strength that you've given us this morning. I thank you, Father, that in your sovereignty you orchestrated everyone that is here for your good will, for our growth in our relationship with you. And we, Father, praise you. And in so doing, Father, we seek to uplift and glorify the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in His name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Hope you got your Bible there. If you don't, you can go ahead and turn to the Pew Bible. If you flip over there to 1 Samuel chapter 11 as we continue our expositional study. I want to make you aware of a couple of different announcements that are coming up. Um, Big ones, you know, one, tomorrow we have our first official meeting in regard to our renovation project. Uh, we're going to be relocated for about eight months. Uh, we were hoping that it was going to be six, but they uh, told, told us that going to be possible uh, with the level of renovation that's going to take place. Some of the different changes that you'll see in the chapel, we're going to be getting new cues, we're going to get a new floor, okay? Um, they're going to be putting in uh, I think it's like eight or nine different pillars in this corner of the building alone because the, the support members are just getting the room. We'll be getting a new door in the back by the sound booth to actually get you directly into the hallway so you don't have to go out and fight the rain if you've got to go to use the facility over there. This passageway over here will be removed and you'll get a door that goes directly from here into the hallway as well. Um, be praying about this because it looks, and this is not this is not an exciting thing, it looks as if we're going to lose our windows. Uh, they're looking at having to move this up in order to support the roof. Which involves a couple of different challenges. It means in the winter it'll be a little bit more cold, and in the summer it'll be a little bit more hot. So just want to give you up to date on that one. So that's the first meeting that we'll be having this tomorrow afternoon. So we pray in that regard. Um, second thing, this next week on the 13th, we have uh, Morning for Moms. I hope that uh, if you're a mom and you want to come by and, and, and check that out, there is a registration process that you'll need to, to go through. And that's only because they like to know how much food and how much material to prepare. Um, I've heard nothing but great um, uh, you know, things about the program. There's only four of them. This will be three of four, so we have one more that's going to be coming up in September. So I encourage you to be a part. Uh, you can call our office 
talk with RG3 in the back or myself. We'll get you some more information. Uh, if you haven't noticed this, I hope you pick one up in the back. And we have OR auditions for Christmas coming up on the 22nd. There are 18 different parts, various ages, from very little all the way up to grandpa. So if you would like to be uh, involved, um, I will tell you though, and, and Griff knows this, and everybody that was involved, um, we take the thing seriously. This is not backyard drama type of thing. We try to make it as professional as we can with the resources uh, that are involved. And so it will entail some work. Okay, so I'm just letting you know, okay, this is not one where you show up on Sunday afternoon and do performance that night. Uh, so if you want more information, again, let me know, pull one of these, call us, <coughs> and uh, again, our auditions will be on, the, uh, on August 22nd. Uh, after the, in between the services this morning, we're going to give you a little glimpse for what took place with uh, DBS, so if you want to... Uh, see some faces or your children when you bring down the screen as people are transitioning in and out so they can see that. Um, and that is all I have. Is there any other announcements that I have not made or that you're aware of that uh, everyone should know about? Fantastic. All right. This morning's message is what you believe. Take a look at 1 Samuel chapter 11. I'm going to start reading in verse 8, and then uh, shortly into the introduction, I'm going to go back and give us a little context in verses 6 and 7. So, <clears throat> please follow along with me. I'll be reading from the New International Version. It says this, When Saul mustered them at Bezek, the men of Israel numbered 300,000, and the men of Judah 30,000. They told the messengers who had come, say to the men of Jabez Gilead, by this time, well, no, by the time the sun is hot tomorrow, you will be delivered. When the messengers went and reported to the men, the men of Jabez, they were elated. They said to the Ammonites, tomorrow we will surrender to you and you can do to us whatever seems good to you. The next day, Saul separated his men into three divisions. During the last watch of the night, they broke into the camp of the Ammonites and slaughtered them until the heat of the day. Those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. The people then said to Samuel, Who was it that asked, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring these men to us and we will put them to death. But Saul said, No, no one shall be put to death today. For this day the Lord has rescued Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal and there reaffirm the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal and reaffirmed Saul as king in the presence of the Lord. There they sacrificed fellowship offerings before the Lord. And Saul and all the Israelites held a great celebration. <clears throat> Father, thank you. And please instruct us. For our greatest in Jesus' name, amen. As you might know, I, I'm somewhat of, of a movie buff. Uh, you know, I, 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 besides the fact that I, I came from the same hometown as George Lucas, <clears throat> you know, the rest of California. Um, one of the series that George Lucas did is Indiana Jones. How many of you have seen, you've, you've seen those? Okay. <clears throat> the last one that I really, you know, the Crystal Skull thing, I think that should have never been made, but uh, The Last Crusade I thought was kind of interesting. If you know the plot of the story, what it is is you've got, you know, uh, Indiana Jones, who's actually Henry James Jones Jr., okay, <clears throat> Meet, meets up with his dad, played by Sean Connery. Uh, and they're out looking for the Holy Grail. Now, don't get confused with Monty Python. Okay, that's not what we're talking about here. <clears throat> but the Holy Grail was supposed to be the cup that Jesus used at the Last Supper. And it was supposed to have, you know, uh, healing powers, these magical, miraculous powers that if somebody drank them, this, they'd live forever, and it would heal any type of 
you know, disease or, or, or ailment or injury that a person faced. And so toward the climax of the movie, <clears throat> they're in this temple that, uh, you know, and they found, or, or they're on the process of trying to find a girl. They're on that last step, and uh, uh, the uh, antagonist, guy named Christine Lover, okay, shoots Indiana Jones' dad. Okay. All right? And now his dad is dying. And he's faced with what we call a crisis of faith. Because he, the antagonist, says this to Indiana Jones. He says, it's time to ask yourself what you believe. You've been on this search for a while. It's time to ask yourself what you truly believe. One of the things that I mention quite frequently is this. <clears throat> if my premise is incorrect, then everything that flows from that premise is also incorrect. Now, it may not be that far off, but it might be just one degree. If you stay on that course, though, by the time it becomes reckoning, you're going to be miles from where you need to be. Second thing I try to, try to promote as a method for which to us to evaluate what is taught or evaluate our own theology, our systematic thing, when we come to Scripture, <clears throat> is to understand that any interpretation of Scripture, any philosophical worldview, any denominational treatise that violates a characteristic of God has to be incorrect. Okay? And that's where we get into, we get into a problem in Christianity. Why? Because I'm taught a school of thought. And then when I come to a tough passage, what I have a tendency of doing is playing theological, theological gymnastics to get that passage to tell me or to reaffirm what I believe versus saying, okay, what I believe needs to adjust to what Scripture says, even if I don't understand it at this time. Because God's characteristics do not change. And that's great. I mean, how would you feel if you were standing right there at Pearly Gates and God said, well, hey, you didn't get the memo? We changed that thing like last week. You ever, you ever face one of those? You know, we, we do in the military from time to time. We get that update. We're still waiting for this, the, the revision to the sec nav 7010 uh, you know, 6-alpha so we can change a little bit on how we spend the ROF. But that change hasn't come yet. It's been told that we're getting it. But it hasn't happened. Now I'll tell you this: like you said, I've said it before. Context is key. And verses six and seven of this passage gives us context as to what is taking place. Look at verse six and seven. It says, "When when Saul heard these words, what was happening? The men of Jabesh Gilead, okay, Naash, had come in. He had conquered the area, and he said, hey, this is what I'm going to do.' You know." Uh, you say, hey, make a treaty with me. Okay, fine. I'm going to make a treaty, but I'm going to, what, gouge out your eye. So that's a little bit of the context. When Saul hears this, okay, that's the context of verse 6. When he heard these words, the Spirit of God came upon him in power, and he burned with anger. And he sent, okay, he sent the, the P, oh, excuse me, the, the back. verse 7. He took a pair of ox, and he cut them into pieces, and he sent the pieces uh, by messenger throughout Israel proclaiming this is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel. Then the terrible Lord fell on the people and he turned out as one man. Context. That's what's going on. See, I love the Word of God because it is very, very clear as to how God operates. Zechariah 4 6. If you have not memorized it, you got to memorize this one. Because it says, it's one of the very first verses I ever memorized when I came to know Jesus. It says this Not by power or by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Now, what does that mean? You might think you got great resources and stuff like this, but you want to know something? It's not by power or by might. 
It's by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. If it were not for the fact that the Spirit of God came upon Saul in power, and the terror of the Lord fell on the people, then there would have been no victory for Jabez's children. The question that we will be entertaining is this. Why? Namely, God, why was it necessary to bring the nation to this point? Why bring them to this crisis of faith? Well, again, by way of introduction, let me give you perhaps a definition of what I mean by crisis of faith. With your permission and for the sake of this lesson and understanding a portion of our own relational growth with Jesus, I'd like to define this crisis of faith as a turning point, a hinge pin, <clears throat> an event that happened that brings you to a place where you have to choose what you will believe. Will you choose to trust Jesus? Or will you try to trust yourself? Or trust your resources? And this brings me to our key idea. It says this, growth in our relationship with Jesus takes place in context. It is part of our learning that He can be trusted. Okay? That he is faithful. So, what do you believe? Is he really Lord and Savior? Did he really forgive, past tense, your sin? Did his sacrifice on the cross pay the penalty for your sin? Are you, because of what he did, eternally accepted in God's sight? Are you his child? Now, I have an example. I need Corey to come up here. Uh, wrong Corey. Come here, Mr. Corey. I got, I, I, I got a favor to ask. I want to ask you just a couple of quick little questions here. You guys for me, I got, I got a hand for you. Check, check. All right, I'm going to give you that. I'm going to ask you a couple little questions. Just, just tell me what you think. Okay, what do you need to do in order to be your dad's son? Do um, it. Okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring your dad up here, okay, because i got to validate, all right? Now, in order for Corey to be your son, does he have to do everything that you tell him to do? Oh, something's wrong here. Okay, so tell me, what is it that you need to do to be his kid? You don't know? Okay. What does he need to do to be your child? Nothing. He's already your child. How come? You're doing great. But do you know why? Uh-huh. And because, guess what? You were born. That's it. Thank you so much. Give that guy a hand. That was so amazing. You did not know that it was coming. Here's my point. We believe that in order for us to be a child of God, we have got to do something. We are a child by birth. Okay? And there's no one who can take that away. And it's a great thing. But when we're young, we can become easily confused. And we can think that our dad is upset with us because we haven't followed those things. No. He loves us. John chapter 1, verse 12. To as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. If you receive Jesus, you are a child of God. So we've got to keep things in context. So my first point is this. Resources 
in context. Look at verses 8 through 10. Here are some of the resources that the writer here says or he notes that uh, Saul had at his disposal. First thing, you got Saul, you got Samuel, and you got 330,000 men. Next, you have a rough out plan, apparently agreed upon by the leadership of what they should do. We see this uh, in verse 9 when it says, um, they told the messenger. Okay? The next thing we see here is that you have the motivated inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead, right? They're kind of motivated for a very, very important reason. I don't want to lose my right eye. Next thing, you have what we call this topography of the land. Now, what it is, if you do the research there, you got a fairly significant incline from the Jordan River Valley, which is below sea level, up to the city, Jabesh Gilead, which is a thousand feet above sea level. Next, and this is a very, very important resource to understand in, in context. You have the overconfidence of the Ammonites. Look at verse 10. It says this. They said to the Ammonites, Tomorrow we will surrender to you, and you can do to us whatever seems good to you. They must have thought, Hey, we got this thing won. It's just academic now. The no-brainer question associated with this is this. Did God need these resources to accomplish His will? And the answer is no. I mean, if you do a study through the Old Testament, you'll find some of the most lopsided battles that for some apparent reason is won by the wrong side. I'll give you perhaps the most ridiculous one that I could find. It's found in... Uh, 2 Kings chapter, cha chapter 7. It's where you have the um, Aramean army that is defeated by four lepers. You know, situation, they're being starved, right? The Aramean army's got the, got the city, you know, fully boxed in. They're not getting any food. Right? And so, you know, what, what do these four lepers say? Hey, we're going to go over there. If they, if they, you know, if they hold us captive, fantastic. At least they'll feed us. If not, we're going to die anyway. So they go running over to the, the camp, and guess what? Everybody's gone. And so they just go fall on the spoils. And then they get this little, you know, you know, poor attitude. Hey, we gotta go let everybody else know. <laughs> it's a great victory. Point. God doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our resources. What he wants us to do is trust him. The point is simple. You have to keep what you consider to be your resources in context. But then you also need to add to them a God who can do anything. You know, Psalm 24, verse 1, last part says this, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. He's sovereign. He's in control. That's our first one. We've got to keep resources in context. Second thing, you need to keep strategy in context. The strategy of the battle, excuse me, the strategy for the battle was as follows. You can see this in verses 11 through 13. Saul goes and he separates the troops into 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Marine Divisions. Uh, you know, we're the Navy. You know, Marines are part of the Navy. I don't think the Marines know that. Okay. There you go. You got this pre-sunrise attack that takes place, and you see that in verse 11. So when it says during the last watch, we're talking somewhere between... 0300 and 06. You have a sustained assault that takes place. It lasts until the heat of the day. So it starts early and it ends someplace between 14 and 1600 in the afternoon. The goal. Total death and devastation. You look at verse 
11, the second part, it says this, no two were left together. Saul basically said, we're going to settle this once and for all. Now you can have that type of confidence when you know that you are on God's side. I'm going to tell you a, a quick little thing about how uh, I got in confrontation with one of my instructors. You know, I, I mentioned to one of my instructors that I, I love the fact that uh, I like to do an examination of premise because I want to make sure my premises are correct. You know? And I thought that it was kind of interesting that the only reason that George Washington got across the Hudson was the night before. It rained like crazy, so it was really, really muddy. And the very, very next morning, because of the heat associated with it, they had this pea soup fog that the British couldn't see through. You couldn't see eight feet in front of you. And so I go, I, I said, hey, is it just by coincidence that that, or, or is that divine sovereignty? The guy came back and says, you, you got to be careful when you go and you start saying that, oh, hey, God is on our side. I said, that's my point, exactly. He said, what do you mean? I said, the issue is not, oh, God is on our side. The issue is, I'm on God's side. And then he said, I was playing with semantics. I'm not playing with semantics. There are a lot of people who have said, oh, hey, God's on our side, and that's wrong. The question is, are you on God's side? What does the word of God say? Are you following to the best of your ability, best of your understanding? Goal was total de devastation, like we said before. Strategy, though. So after we have this battle that's won, we have this strategy for the throne. Look at verses 12 and 13. Now, when the army, when any army wins, there are those who are quick to levy criticism and retribution on those who struggle to act, or who, those who struggle to believe. So look at verse 12, it says this. Who was it that asked, shall Saul reign over us? Bring these men to us so that we can put them to death. Whoa, hello. You know, here's one strategy for securing the throne. Kill everybody that disagrees with you. Right? That's what they were saying here. Who was it that said Saul shooting him? Now, what I like to do is I like to mention that you need to keep these things in context. You know, you got those that are saying, hey, whose notion was it to have a king? Well, it was mine. Quick to jump on that bandwagon. Huh? But, oh, by the way, just want to give you a, a, a little reminder. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, which we went through, um, well, we find out that Saul and God didn't consider it to be a great idea either. Verse 7 says, listen, it is not they, I'm just shooting, it's not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me. Oh my God, it's him. The point, though, that I want to make is this. Some go to an extreme to validate their, that their opinion was right. They'll go to an extreme. Even to the point of canceling out everybody else who may have not been comfortable with the decision. But, question, what if they lost? Would they have been all that fired up to say, oh, hey, I was the one that came up with that idea? Or would they have just remained quiet? You know, John Steinbeck said this, the, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. Strategy must be kept in context. We must uh, understand that strategy must keep God's sovereignty in context as well. Verse 13, it says that God gives Saul some sound wisdom for the purpose of uniting the nation. He says this, no one shall be put to death today. Saul gives God the credit. This is the day the Lord has rescued Israel. We're not going to go negative on this. Finally, what I want you to understand is we've got to keep the ministry in context as well. And we see this in verses 14 and 15. 
And in 14 it says, Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal and there reaffirm the kingship. The word reaffirm there, it's used once in this form in, in the Old Testament. It means to renew, rebuild, or repair. So Samuel, the priest, the spiritual part of the thing, he gets on board as well. My point in adding this is this. As a congregation, you need to understand that pastors, chaplains, lay leaders, civilian contract professionals, clergy, whatever the flavor is that you want to say, are not exempt from having negative opinions. I mean, we're working through this thing as much as everybody else is. We're human. We have opinions on how we think things should, you know, proceed. But our opinions don't necessarily mean that they are of the Lord. If they don't line up with what Scripture says, then they're not of the Lord. So let me challenge you again. Don't say, oh, hey, Tabitha Roberts said this, therefore it is divine. Do the research. If you spot something that doesn't make sense, come and tell me, hey, you know, hey, Tabitha, you, you mentioned this, and did I understand it incorrectly, or, or can you show me where you, that, that was, you know, where you drew that from? A lot of times when, hey, if I'm not sure, I'll say, hey, my opinion is this. All right? But Scripture encourages us to test the spirits, to check it out, make sure it lines up. The point here is that Samuel had to get with the program in order for the rest of the nation to get with the program. Because there are those that will follow you just because of who you are. And they won't do the research. They'll just take you at your word. And so because Samuel gets with the program, notice what happens. The people join in God's plan. The leader and his position is, is confirmed. The fellowship with God is emphasized and everyone celebrates. It's party big time. And so let me bring this to our conclusion here. If you got your Bible, flip over to 1 Peter. We're going to be cruising through 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11, 11 through 21. But I want you to go ahead and get a head start. See, the spiritual condition of the nation will affect its choice of leadership. This condition will affect what it considers to be ethical, fitting, and virtuous. It will affect society's standards concerning morality. But what it won't affect is it won't affect morality itself. Why? Because the standards on morality were defined by law. Old Testament law. That's why they refer to it as the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions. But neither the choice of a leader or the degradation of standards will prevent God from accomplishing His will. Uh, now, I, you know, personally, I may not believe or agree with the selection or direction of an assigned or elected official, but I can always trust in God's faithfulness. And so when I come to Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, and it says everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, then I can do that. I did a word search on that this morning here. The word must submit, okay? It's used one time. It's a present passive imperative third person singular. Present means it applies now. Passive means that it's something that I have to do. Somebody else did it, I have to respond to it. Okay? Imperative, it's an order. Third person singular, you. You specifically. Not the group of you. That would be second person. Okay? And it means that we must 
subject ourselves. We must line up behind. So what's the takeaway? It goes back to that first quote. It's time for you to ask yourself, what do I believe? Do I believe that God is sovereign? Do I believe that He's faithful? Do I believe that He can work in any situation to bring about His will? Do I believe that He's allowing me to go through this for my good? Do I believe that I am His child? That my sins have been forgiven? Do I believe that I have eternal life? Do I believe that I am free? The Apostle Peter was perhaps most noted for being bold, but sometimes saying rather boastful things with, um, I would say, little or no consideration about how they were going to aim back. You know, we used to call them, you know, hey, this sort of, you know, open mouth, insert foot, okay, open mouth again, insert other foot. Okay, you know. What's kind of interesting about Peter's life is that after he came to know Jesus, he became one of the most, how do you call, meat potato leaders of the early church. And so since we're looking at simple application of this message, I want to offer God's words of wisdom through Peter. And you find this again in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. I'm going to just go down the list of what's there, and I'll take a little bit of a break just to... To, to emphasize the passage or two. But the first thing that he encourages us to do in that passage is to recognize that you are aliens and strangers in the world. That's why he uses the, the phrase, therefore. And so what does he want us to do? He, he says this, abstain from simple desires. Why? Because they wage war against your soul. I think it's really interesting that they don't wage war against your spirit. Your soul, your suitcase. If you go and you get involved in sin, then it's going to play. The enemy's going to have the opportunity to play on your mind. You're giving him a foothold. And so that's why he says abstain from doing that. It wages war in your mind. Second, the next thing he says, live beyond criticism and trust God's sovereignty. You see that verse 12. Again, he reaffirms this issue of line up or submit under the authorities. The, the word there is an aorist passive in, imperative. Okay? It's still in order. Why? Look at verse 15. For it is God's will, it's his plan, that by doing good you should what? Silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Next, he says, live free, but don't use your freedom to cover up what's wrong. Next thing he says, show proper respect to everyone, believers, God, God, and the authority. Next thing he says, line up under your boss with all respect. That's kind of interesting. That's not an imperative. Why? Because the phrase is servant. If you're a servant, this is what you will do. It doesn't need to be a woman. That's who you are. Line up under your boss with all respect, whether he is tolerant or strict. And finally, Peter tells us this, verses 19 through 21. Why? For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called. You were called to do the second you were called to be people of character and integrity. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example 
that you should follow his steps. Yes, this was what we were called to. The question that we begin with is the question that we will leave today with as well. It's time to ask yourself what you believe. Let's pray together. And as the praise team comes up to get ready for our final song, I know we're kind of loose. We stand. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we want to thank you for the message you have brought to us this morning, God. And you have challenged us. You challenged us with what we truly believe. God, I'm convinced that if we truly trust in you, if we truly, Father, had that level of a relationship where Paul said that I've learned the secret of being content, and that we can do all things through, through you because you are one of the God, I, I'm convinced that we would be different people. This would be a different we would trust one another. We'd say, hey, I've got you back. I'm not going to read into anything. I'm going to pray for you. And God, so by way of dedication of our hearts to you, we hand those fears that the enemy uses. We hand those, that poor stuff in his father that we might have. We hand our, I would call it infancy, over to you as we seek to grow in our relationship with you. Father, we praise as we end our service today. For I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I apologize for the length of the hour we do have another service coming in. God bless you. Thank you for joining us this morning.